Thank you for the invitation to speak in the seminar. I have to apologize that it's late, but um, my internet was down until about 30 seconds ago. Um, of today of all people, I decided to do this. Anyway, um, I think yours was the first sort of large scale um, online seminar that started after the pandemic hit. I think the Vantage seminar had been running for a while, but that's been running, that was running even before the pandemic. And I think you guys were sort of up and running for the longest time. So um, when I first accepted the invitation a while ago to speak, I had hoped to speak actually about some other work uh, that's ongoing. And then as so much these days, that work didn't exactly progress at the speed that we had hoped for, for, for reasons that have nothing to do with mathematics. And um, we really haven't gotten far enough to give a meaningful talk about this. So I decided instead to speak about something slightly older. And this is work that was published last year in a special uh, volume of contemporary mathematics uh, that celebrated the 75 year anniversary of the journal Mathematics of Computation. And this is joint work with my recently graduated PhD student, Perlas Karane, and my colleague and um, her co-supervisor, Matthew Greenberg. So for this talk, I'm going to assume that people have some familiar with, familiarity with elliptic curves, but that you really haven't seen any Drinfeld modules before. So that you've maybe heard the term modular polynomial or isogeny graph in connection with an, with elliptic curves, but not, not really anything with Drinfeld modules. So if you're very familiar with Drinfeld modules, um, I don't know, take a snooze for the first little while or something. Okay, so uh, just for motivation, so Drinfeld modules were introduced in 1974 by Vladimir Drinfeld who's um, a researcher at the University of Chicago. He didn't call them Drinfeld modules, he called them elliptic modules. Um, we know them as Drinfeld modules now. And he introduced them in the course of proving the Langlands conjectures for GL2 over global function fields. And the aim was to, to have some, some function field analog of the theory of complex multiplication. And the rank two Drinfeld modules in particular bear close similarities with kind of sister objects in the world of number fields. The rank one Drinfeld modules are very similar to cyclotomic fields. And uh, I'll say something about this in, in a couple of minutes. And the rank two Drinfeld modules um, are sort of the function field analog of elliptic curves and are very, very similar to elliptic curves. Okay, um, so I have a slide that has a laundry list of similarities between drill fight modules and elliptic curves. And then another slide that has this, the differences. And one of the things that makes this area interesting, especially from a computational point of view, is that you chug along and you try and adapt things from the world of elliptic curves and it works all great and, and everything works out nicely until it doesn't. And then you run into these kind of subtle differences um, that make in particular a big difference in computations. So the similarities are, um, so, so this reads like a slide of, of a laundry list of properties for elliptic curves. So Drinfeld modules are um, classified into ordinary and super singular. Um, they have attached to them J invariants and the outlier J invariant is J equals zero. So there's no 1728 here. And they have a similar structure automorphism group, which is almost always similar, except J equals zero has some extra endomorphisms. There's a notion of torsion points, except points are not really geometric points, like there's no point addition, but there's still a notion of point torsion. And um, the torsion at a particular um, prime element P determines uh, ordinary or super singular. They have isogenies and dual isogenies. Um, there's a notion of a Drinfeld modular polynomial and the nth Drinfeld modular polynomial parameterizes pairs of N isogenous Drinfeld modules. And then if you restrict to N being a prime, uh, in this case, an irreducible polynomial, and you build the isogeny graph, uh, where the vertices are J invariants and the edges are L isogenies, then this has a very similar structure to elliptic curves. So in the ordinary case, uh, um, the sorry, um, uh, it's a, it has a very similar structure. And in particular, the ordinary components are, are volcanoes. And the endomorphism ring also looks similar. So um, in the finite field case, the uh, endomorphism ring is an order in an imaginary quadratic field in the ordinary case, and then maximal order in the quaternion algebra over a function field in the super singular case. So this is all wonderful and immediately uh, very analogous to elliptic curves, but then there's different things. So 
the first difference is there's no geometry. Like we have for points on elliptic curves, you can't add points or things like that. We don't have any of this. Um, there's no group structure. Um, there's no VILU formulas as a result because VILU formula for isogenies is based on sort of, um, you know, the, the, the arithmetic of points. In general, in function fields, all valuations are non Archimedean, so the absolute value behaves very differently. Uh, there's a notion of twin fault modular forms, and they have expansions, which is the analog to Fourier expansions. Um, but they're not like always the same. For elliptic curves, the J function is the J function. Each lattice has one J function. But for elliptic curves, it depends on the finite base field FQ. And that turns out to make an enormous difference for computations and bounds and this kind of thing. Uh, so the J function looks and behaves differently. Modular polynomials look and behave differently. Most notably, the growth rate of their coefficients is actually different. Um, a side note that's not going to be relevant here, Drinfeld modules seem to be completely unsuitable for cryptography. Everything that's hard for an elliptic curve seems to be easy for, for um, Drinfeld modules. And finally, what attracted us to this topic is that there's been very little sort of serious computational work and, and, and actual formal algorithm analysis and complexity theory analysis and so on. Um, uh, there, there were some, I mean, there's some imp um, algorithms implemented in Magma. Let me mention a couple of just recent um, uh, work, including this one. So a couple of years ago, uh, Mosley, who was a student at the University of Waterloo, and his um, supervisor, Eric Schost, uh, developed a couple of um, very in in fast algorithms for, for computing the characteristic polynomial of Frobenius. So the trace of Frobenius, that's the um, Drinfeld analog of point counting. And then in this work, what we developed is um, algorithms to compute the J function expansion to an arbitrary position, to compute modular polynomials, um, isogeny volcanoes, endomorphism rings, um, and in general, isogenies and dual isogenies. So for isogenies, we needed sort of an analog of the loose formulas. Now, uh, what we opted to do for, for, for Karane's thesis work is to take a theory that's already in existence for Drinfeld modules and take algorithms that was ba was, were based on that theory. So for example, the classical analytic method for computing modular polynomials. Um, but that meant that some of our algorithms do not correspond to state-of-the-art algorithms for elliptic curves. That's what we're working on now. So with um, a, a current PhD student, Edgar Pacheco Castan, we're working on taking some of the faster, more state-of-the-art algorithms um, developing the corresponding machinery for Drinfeld modules and then implementing them. So that's sort of an overview. So with that, let's start, what's a Drinfeld module? Well, the first thing we need, let me set the stage with some notation here. So throughout the talk, Q is going to be a prime power. FQ is a finite field of order Q. Um, then we take an extension of FQ. So let's call that L. Later on, we'll, we'll fix particular Ls, but for now, it's just any extension of FQ. Tau is the Qth power for Benius. So that just raises elements to the power Q. And finally, L of X is the polynomial ring over L. So just very basic notation. And then we need the notion of an additive polynomial. An additive polynomial satisfies this equation here. So as a polynomial, not, not by substituting values, but as a polynomial. And it's well known that a polynomial is additive if and only if it has this kind of a form here. So all the monomials that appear have exponents that are powers of Q. So that's precisely the additive polynomials. Okay, uh, now a slight change of topic. Um, let's look at an element in L and let's look at the endomorphism that's given by multiplication by L. So we'll connect to to additive polynomials in just a minute, and let's do a little calculation. So we want to see how tau and alpha play together. So we take tau alpha and we let it loose on x, and x is, is now, we're doing this for polynomials. So x is the, the variable of the polynomial. Let's do a quick little calculation. Well, that's just tau of alpha x. And what does tau do? It raises to the power q. So that's just alpha to the q, x to the q. And that's just the same as alpha to the q times tau of x. So tau alpha, when you let it loose on x, acts commutatively, non-commutatively, and is the same as alpha to the q times tau. 
And that defines a multiplication between elements in alpha and the Frobenius tau. And with that, we can define this object here, L of curly brackets tau. This is a ring. This is the ring of twisted polynomials in tau with coefficients in L, and it's a subring of the endomorphism ring of L. So the addition here is, this is polynomials in tau, the addition is the standard addition, but the multiplication is this twisted multiplication here, where tau alpha is alpha to the Q tau. So this is a non-commutative multiplication. So that's the ring of twisted polynomials. And um, what does this have to do with additive polynomials? Well, there's a bijection between the set of additive polynomials over L and this ring, and it goes like this, where you have X to the Q to the I here becomes tau to the I. So formally, what does this map look like? Well, if I have an additive polynomial f of x, that's the same as taking this polynomial g of tau here, that looks like this, and letting it loose on x, letting it act on x. So of course, this is just a bijection. It's not an isomorphism because one of these rings is, is commutative and the other one isn't. OK, right. And with that, um, we're almost ready to define a Drinfeld module. We need one more piece of notation. I'm going to. Um, use the notation A throughout for the polynomial ring over FQ, and K is the field of fractions, so the ring of rational functions uh, over FQ in an indeterminate T, not the same as X as before. Um, this is standard notation in the function field world and the Drinfeld world, and now we're going to look at a specific field L. I said we're going to use specific field Ls, and we're going to try to map this A into L in some sort of canonical way. And those maps are called structure map. And there's two cases. The first is the finite field case, where we basically let L be an extension of, of um, F of degree D. So we take an irreducible polynomial, monic and irreducible P of T, and then we form the quotient ring. And so this is just the degree D extension. And the structure map is just the natural subjection. So a polynomial L gets mapped into this F, 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 Q to the D, via taking A mod P. And that corresponds to the case of elliptic curves over finite fields. And the other case is the analytic case that corresponds to elliptic curves over the complex numbers. And we form sort of this rather horrid looking field here. And this is the following. So first you start with the rational function field. We take its completion at infinity. So that's um, preserve series in T to the minus one. And then you get a complete field. But that's not algebraically closed. So you take the algebraic closure. That's the bar here. So now it's algebraically closed, but it's no longer complete. So you take the completion again. But fear not, you don't have to keep playing this game, because now you actually have a field that is both algebraically closed and complete with respect to the infinite, infinite place. And so that um, is the function field analog of the complex numbers, a field that's algebraically closed and complete with respect to the infinite place. And the structure map embedding A into this is just inclusion. So those are the two cases we're going to look at. For our computations, we're always looking at the first case. But for the analytic theory, we need that second case. So I'll say a little bit about the second case in, in a moment, and then we'll never look at it again. OK, so what's it doing? So here's a sample computation once you embed A into L of tau of this sort of funny twisted multiplication, just if you've never seen this, so you can wrap your head around it. So let's take, so this is now an element in L because polynomials are embedded into L. So this is a polynomial in tau. So this is in, sorry, this is in L of tau. And the coefficient is a polynomial in T. So that's an object in A. Okay, how do we multiply this? Well, we multiply everything by everything. That's what we always do. But now in this red term here, things are out of order because the, the, the coefficient should always be to the left of tau. So let's pull the tau squared apart. Now remember how does tau act on things? It raises things to the q's power. So tau acting on t squared is t squared to the q. Okay. And now we need to let the second tau act. So we let the second act tau act on t to the 2q. And again, it raises it to the power q and we get this result. So this is, this is a simple computation in L of tau when A is embedded in this. And, and this, these are objects that we're going to be using with is, is um, that we're going to be using is polynomials in tau whose coefficients are polynomials in T. Okay, the images of Drinfeld modules are precisely objects like this. 
Okay, so now we're finally ready to define a Drinfeld module. So a Drinfeld module isn't a module at all. It's actually a map. It's an FQ algebra homomorphism. So specifically, it's an FQ algebra homomorphism from the polynomial ring A into this ring of twisted polynomials L, where L is now one of the choices we had from before. It's either a, a finite field extension of FQ, or it's this funny complex number like field C. So it maps a polynomial A to an image, which in the world of Drinfeld modules is usually denoted phi sub A, rather than phi of A with brackets. It's usually phi sub A. And it only has to satisfy two pretty simple properties. Firstly, the constant term. So every image phi A is a polynomial in tau with coefficients in L. And the constant coefficient of this polynomial is A, or rather the image of A under the structure map A, in, in A embedding into L. So it's either A modulo P, or it's just A itself via inclusion. Okay, and the second condition is a non-degeneracy condition that tells us not all images of this Drinfeld module are constant polynomials. So at least one image is an honest to goodness actual polynomial in tau. So that's what a Drinfeld module is. Now, of course, the first question is, if it's not a module, why is it called a module? So why a module? And the reason is that it, oops, I'm very sorry. Uh, the reason is that um, it turns this field L into an A module in a new way. So if, if I take an element alpha in L and a polynomial A in A, then you can turn L into an A module just by ordinary multiplication. I take alpha and I multiply it by A. That's a multiplication in L via this structure map that maps A into L, and that's a module action. But a Drinfeld module provides a different module action via, namely, A acting on L is just phi sub A, the image of the Drinfeld module of A, acting on alpha, so substituting alpha. So the constant coefficient of this thing here is A tau to the zero by property one. And tau to the zero is the identity map. And so the identity map maps alpha to alpha. So that means this thing starts out with A alpha plus some higher terms here, not of tau, but rather of tau of alpha. That's an, that's an error. And the non-degeneracy sh um, condition shows that this is not always just equal to the first term. So this has some, some other terms here as well. So it's a new way. It's a different module action. So that's why they were called Drinfeld modules, but they're FQ algebra homomorphisms. All right, so it's basically just an FQ algebra homomorphism mapping polynomials into this ring of twisted polynomials subject to these two conditions. The second one is, is, is just non-degeneracy and the first one is that just the constant coefficient is just A. Okay, so um, some properties. The, property, the first property is when the structure map is inclusion, then this is injective because the constant coefficient is the same as the argument, right? So, so if, if, um, if, uh, if two images are equal, then their constant coefficients are equal, which means that their inputs are equal. Um, the second thing is because it's an FQ algebra homomorphism, all you need to write it down to define it fully it's, it's, is its image on T. And then via the FQ algebra homomorphism property, that determines what it is on the entire ring of polynomials. So you can just write it down. What is the image of T? Well, the constant coefficient is T. Um, and then you get a bunch of other coefficients here in L. And it's, it somehow has a degree here. So CR is non-zero. So it has a polynomial degree, R, as a polynomial. And this R is called the rank of phi. It's not called the degree, it's the rank of phi. And why is it the rank of phi? Well, there's a notion of a torsion, as I mentioned before, which has nothing to do with, with a torsion group or something. It's just the kernel of a particular image. So I take a polynomial A, I form its image, phi sub A, that's an endomorphism. And if I take that, that endomorphism's kernel, so all the roots basically, right? There's a polynomial, it's just the roots of this polynomial. Then that kernel is isomorphic to this free rank R module. And that's why it's called the rank of phi, okay? 
And just to sort of make the connection to, to, to give you some idea of where Langlands come in and where, where Drenfeld used this is that if you join this torsion to L, you get a Galois action and that, that injects into GLR of this ring. Okay, so there you see the, you get an inkling of, of where Langlands comes in, right? And in particular, the rank R case, this is actually an isomorphism and this group is just A mod A, A star. And this corresponds to Z mod A, Z star. So this is just a multiplicative group uh, uh, in, in uh, modulo A here. And so with that, let's look at the cases of small rank. So if the first rank is the rank one Drinfeld module, there's only up to isomorphism one rank one Drinfeld module, and it looks like this. And it was actually proposed to Car by Carlitz in 1935, long, long, long before Drinfeld introduced Drinfeld modules. And it looks like this. And by what I just said on the previous slide, if you, if you join, I've now switched my A's to M to make it look a little bit more like what we're used to um, from cyclotomic field. So if you take a polynomial M and you join the M torsion, you get this Galois um, extension and its Galois group is Z mod M Z star, while it's A mod M A star. And so this is what I mean when I say these are the analogs of cyclotomic fields. They behave exactly like cyclotomic fields. They have a Galois group, they have a, a similar Galois group and many, many other ways. So that's all I'm gonna say about rank two, one Drenfeld module modules and the rank two Drenfeld modules looks like, the, looks like this, you know, it's image on T is given like this. This is the notation that's usually used, G and Delta. And that's not an accident. The Delta is meant to look like the discriminant Delta of an elliptic curve. And the G notation is used of, well, for elliptic curves over C, oftentimes the coefficients are called G2 and G3. And so this is the same G sort of, okay? And you see here, in fact, um, they have something attached to them. That's a J invariant. And if this Q plus one were three, then it would look like the J invariant of an elliptic curve. Um, but this is the J invariant of the Drenfeld module. It's an element in L. And you see here already, you get already an inkling of how things are different. The J invariant depends on the base field of the Drenfeld module. So it depends on FQ. Okay. And um, with that, uh, we actually have ordinary and super singular Drenfeld modules. And this is only in the finite field case. So our L is now FP, which is a finite field. And these things are ordinary. Sure enough, if this P torsion, P was the polynomial that defined this extension. If the P torsion is this, then it's ordinary. And if the P torsion is trivial, then it's super singular. This is exactly the characterization from elliptic curves. And rank two Drenfeld modules turn out to be the function field equivalent of elliptic curves. Even though they look very, very different, they're completely different objects. They have these FQ algebra homomorphisms. They share many, many similarities with elliptic curves. Okay, so we can define maps of Drenfeld modules, a morphism um, of, so this is a bizarre notation because phi and psi are mapped, but we still use this notation u from phi into psi. It's a, um, a morphism, it's just a polynomial with coefficients in L bar that satisfies this condition here. So you take any polynomial A, you form its images of the two Drenfeld moduli, phi A and C A, and then you have this relationship here. So that's a morphism. So this is just an, an identity of endomorphisms on L, on L bar actually. Um, it's an endomorphism if the two Drenfeld modules are equal. It's an isomorphism if it's invertible, in which case, um, it's just a constant in L star, in L bar star. It's an isogeny, it's called an isogeny if it's non-zero and it's not hard to see that isogenies preserve rank. Um, every isogeny has a dual isogeny and in this case, the dual isogeny satisfies these two equations. So um, U times its dual is like phi, is phi n and here's psi n. So this is the image of phi and of psi under some fixed polynomial n. And this polynomial is the degree of the isogeny. So here, degrees of isogenies are polynomials. They're no longer integers. And we call this an n isogeny. And then finally, we say that U is defined over L if its coefficients are in L. So we're only going to look at isogenies defined over L. So this is exactly the same lingo for maps between Drenfeld modules as we have between elliptic curves. So let me give you some examples so you actually see what these things look like. Take Q equals three. This polynomial defines our finite field extension L of FQ. And um, here's an example of a T isogeny. So this is, this is a polynomial tau, u is tau plus this polynomial in t, and this is a t isogeny, it has degree t, and it maps this Drenfeld module to this Drenfeld module. So remember, how do you read this? 
This Trinfeld module means that if you take the image of T, then this is T cubed tau squared plus T squared tau plus T. That's the corresponding rank two Trinfeld module. And then the dual is this linear isogeny. So some polynomial times tau plus another polynomial. Here's another example. This is a T plus one isogeny with this dual. Here we have a T plus two isogeny. Um, tau plus this polynomial maps these two Drinfeld modules and the dual is this. And these polynomials are in fact examples of a much more general characterization that we managed to do. Sorry, my, my um, thing here is really sensitive. And that's a characterization of linear isogenies of linear degrees. So these are isogenies that look like this, tau minus alpha for some alpha, and the degree n is linear and monic. And then um, we, we start with the Drinfeld module and we have formulas for the image Drinfeld module. Um, all these parameters satisfy this identity and we have formulas for the dual isogeny and the dual isogeny is also linear, okay? Um, we tried to characterize isogenies of higher degree in this way and yeah, not gonna happen. I mean, the symbolic computations are, are just incredible. Here, you can prove this via symbolic computation on polynomials and it's relatively straightforward, but as soon as you get to higher degrees, it's, it's really horrific. Okay, so I have one slide on the analytic theory of round two Drenthal modules and that's because it's almost, um, I don't wanna say almost identical, but very, very similar to um, the whole analytic world of elliptic curves. So Drinfeld modules of rank R over this funny field C infinity that corresponds to the complex numbers, numbers are, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with rank R lattices over the polynomial ring. Um, this ex correspondence extends to a group isomorphism and in fact an FQ vector space isomorphism of morphisms between rank R Drinfeld modules and morphisms between A lattices. Um, and then the coefficients, if you look at the Drinsfeld module in this analytic world, its coefficients are modular forms, Drinsfeld modular forms in some suitable uniformizer. And they're given in terms of Eisenstein series. And they have these expansions. And we have the analog of Doering lifting. So you can move back and forth. If you're given a Drinsfeld module and an endomorphism, you can move back and forth. Pardon me for one moment. to close my door, pardon me. You can move back and forth between um, Drinfeld modules, pairs of Drinfeld modules and endomorphisms defined over FP, the finite field world, and this field C infinity, which is the analytic world. And you go up via an analog of Doering's lifting, Doering's lifting theory, and you go down via reduction. And so with that, let's delve into this. Uh, let's take a rank two Drinfeld module and la lam da lambda, capital lambda is the lattice associated with it. And then those two coefficients G can be expressed in terms of these Eisenstein series. So E sub Q minus one and E sub Q squared minus one are Eisenstein series of weight Q minus one and Q squared minus one. This is the Eisenstein series of weight K for this lattice. And what is this bracket I and bracket two here? This is just a shorthand notation for this polynomial, T to the Q to the I minus T. So th this should look sort of like stuff that you're used to from the elliptic curve analytic world. You can actually compute these things. And here's where it finally becomes actually very interesting. These are the first few terms of the expansions of these coefficients. They are weighted coefficients by this parameter, pi bar to the Q minus one here, arises from the Eisenstein series of the polynomial ring of the trivial lattice. And it's a normalizing factor and it's kind of the analog of two pi i from the complex numbers. And these are the expansions. This, this bracket one here is again, this polynomial t to the q minus t. Um, S is a uniformizer here, the corresponding uniformizer. What is S here? Well, S is something, is a power of t, t to the q minus one. And what is t? t comes from the exponential function. So this is the exponential function associated to this lambda. And then T inverse is the exponential function corresponding to this lattice, pi bar times A, where pi bar is this normalizing factor. This is the lattice corresponding to the, to the Carlitz module. And it's normalized like this. And so this S is, the is what corresponds to E to the two pi I Z in the analytic world. Now E to the two pi I Z is usually called Q and these, these, these modular forms are usually written in terms of, of uh, uniformizer Q, 
But my Q is already reserved for my finite field, so I couldn't call them Q. So we call them S. The literature usually calls them S. And you look at this, and they look completely and utterly different from what you see for elliptic curves. For elliptic curves, all the even powers appear, right? For elliptic curves, you would have like S squared, well, one and S squared, and S to the fourth, and S to the sixth, and S to the eighth, and so on and so forth. But here you have these very wild powers that are polynomials in Q. They depend heavily on the base field. And these are sparse series, right? So you see that only a few powers of S appear. And the bigger your base field, the sparser they get. This little epsilon, by the way, is just an, an anomaly that happens when you're over F2. You know, it, it's, it's not important what this is. But so here you already see that things are very, very different from the, from the elliptic curve world. These uh, modular forms and modular functions look very, very different from what you see for elliptic curves. OK, now let's move on to the J function. So you can divide these by raised to the power Q plus 1 and divide it. And then you get this J function. And what do J? So here's some examples of J functions for some small Q, 2, 3, 5, and 7. And again, there's some very interesting stuff going on. So for, for elliptic curves, your J function, well, it starts with Q to the minus one, and then you have coefficient 144 and so on, and the coefficients uh, grow very rapidly, and, and the whole thing is very, very dense. But look at what happens here, for example, for Q equals seven. There's this big gap between S to the zero and S to the five. So somehow this sparseness of G and delta is reflected here. There's, there's a whole bunch of things that vanish. Here's another gap from S to the seven to S to the 11. So there's a whole bunch of coefficients that vanish. And not only that, the coefficients of J themselves are sparse polynomials. So here, for example, is a polynomial of degree 49, but it only has three terms. Okay, so these things look completely different from, from uh, what you see in, in, uh, in, in the elliptic curve world. The degrees here grow very rapidly, but the polynomials are totally sparse. OK, so I should mention that we have an algorithm that computes the J function to arbitrary precision. Uh, this is the time and space requirement. So if n is, if the precision is large and q is small, this is small, this is basically n to the 2.5, and space q n squared. O tilde means here I suppress log factors. And we have this implemented in Sage. And because we're working in the non Archimedean world, it's really nice. You can exactly predict the precision and compute this thing up to this precision. And we use this algorithm to compute modular polynomials. So for this, let's move on to the nth modular polynomial. The nth Drinfeld modular polynomial is defined completely analogous to how it's defined for elliptic curves. So it's a polynomial in X, and it depends on a J invariant. And it's the minimal polynomial of J of NZ over this function field here. See infinity adjoint J of Z. So this is exactly the same definition. And it satisfies some very similar properties. So the coefficients are power series in S because J of Z and J of NZ have preserved series expansions in S. So they're power series in S. If you plug in another J invariant for X here, you get zero if and only if the corresponding J invariants or Drinfeld modules are N isogenous. And then it's a poly as, if you look at it as a polynomial in two variables, then it has coefficients in A. So the coefficients are polynomials in T. It's symmetric in X and Y. These are the leading terms. And here, um, this power N of N is this. And what does it mean if I write down the absolute value of a polynomial? Remember our Ns and Ps and everything are now polynomials? Well, this is just Q to the degree. OK? And then in particular for the prime case, in this case where n is an irreducible polynomial, it has degree L plus one. So Q to the degree L plus one. Okay. So here's a small parameterization example again. So you see what this looks like. So Q is three, P of T is this. And this is one of the um, Drinfeld modules we had earlier, one of the isogenies we had earlier. This was our T isogeny from this Drinfeld module to this Drinfeld module. And so let's look at the modular polynomial. So let's look first at the J invariants of these two Drinfeld modules. This has J, J invariant T plus two. This has a slightly bigger J invariant. And so let's form the modular polynomial with respect to this J invariant here. And it looks like this. It's a degree four polynomial. Remember here, our L is linear, it's T. 
So its absolute value is Q, which is three, and the degree is three plus one, so it's degree four. So this is a degree four polynomial, and the coefficients are polynomials in T. So this is now phi over the finite field world, not the analytic world. And we compute the roots of this polynomial. It has these four roots here. And sure enough, one of the roots is this J invariant of Psi. Okay, so in other words, if I plug in the J invariants J of P and J of Phi, you get zero. And this is independent confirmation that these two Drenfeld modules are indeed T isogenous, as we said earlier. Okay, now, um, how do you compute this? Well, our algorithm, we opted to use the standard, the classical complex analytic method to compute these modular polynomials because we had all that machinery in place in the literature already, and we wanted to focus on implementation. So we're looking now at the case where N is uh, an irreducible polynomial, and we compute the modular polynomial via its definition symbolically. So you take J of Z, a particular J of Z, up to a certain precision in the analytic world, and J of LZ up to a certain precision. And then you form this equation where you write down phi L symbolically. So the, the coefficients of phi L are the unknowns and the coefficients of J of Z and J of LZ are computed. And if you compute these to sufficient precision, then you can recover the coefficients of phi L. So this is precisely how this works. So we worked out the exact precision. Again, when you work in the non-Archimedean world, it's really nice. You can work out exact precision. Um, the, uh, the, um, we need to work out the J invariant up to this precision. So Q to the two degree L plus Q to the degree L minus one. And the J of LZ, we need to work out to this precision here. And this is a polynomial, so it's going to have powers of J of LZ in it and powers of J of Z in it. And we need to work out the, these powers as well to, this, to the same precision. And then you plug it all in, and the coefficients of phi L are the unknowns, and it becomes this giant linear algebra problem. So um, you can write it in the form matrix times vector equals right-hand side vector, where the right-hand side vector is known. The left hand side vector, the left, the matrix consists of the coefficients of JLZ and J of Z and its powers. And the vector, the unknown vector, is the coefficients of phi L. And you solve that. And that way you can compute modular polynomials. And our lofty goal, which we're nowhere near, is to start generating a database of modular polynomials similar to what Drew Sutherland has for modular polynomials of elliptic curves. And we're maybe epsilon there. And the problem is that just like in the elliptic curve world, modular polynomials are big. They are very big. So here's a very, very small example. So this is again over F3, sort of it, it doesn't get much tinier than F3. And this is for the irreducible polynomial T squared plus one. This has absolute, absolute value, um, t squared plus one has absolute value three squared, which is nine. And so the degree of the modular polynomial is 10. And here it is. So here, here are all the coefficients. Um, it starts with x to the 10, y to the 10, and then x to the nine, y to the nine, and so on, all the way down here to the co constant coefficients. And these are all the coefficients. And you see that it takes, if, if you write this out in a regular PDF file, well, this is four pages for this tiny little example. So this is the problem with modular polynomials, that they are big, and so they are not easy to compute. Okay, so let me compare our algorithm to the um, classical um, algorithm, complex analytic algorithm for computing modular polynomials. So I'm using again O tilde, so I'm suppressing all log factors. And here's the time and space complexity. So the classical analytic method takes L to the 4.5 time. Um, this was originally, Alkis wrote L to the four, but then there was a bit of discrepancy in terms of size of the coefficients and taking growth rate into account. And so Charles Lauder later on um, corrected this to L to the 4.5 and space L cubed. And this is our complexity here, L to the eight, L to the six. So when we first got this, we were mortified. Right? I mean, this is terrible. This is, this is just an absolutely terrible result, right? This is so much worse than what happened with elliptic curves, okay? 
So, I mean, this is, this is multiple orders of magnitude worse. So we were very disappointed. And then we started looking at things a little bit more carefully and we realized, well, th this is more or less as it should be. And the reasons for the discrepancy, and this is why, it's, why I'm saying that when you start doing computations of these things in the world of Drinfeld modules, you run into these, these differences where this whole analogy between elliptic curve and Drinfeld modules is simply not true anymore. So the difference is in the growth rate of the coefficients of both the powers of the J function and the modular polynomial itself. So there's a bound on the kth coefficient of the ith power of the J function. In the elliptic curve world, this is essentially square root of Ki, essentially square root of I is the, ith, is the, is the coefficients of J to the I. In the Drinfeld module world, this was bounded by, by essentially I. So instead of square root of I, it's bounded by I. Now, if you stare at the expansion of the J function, you go like, no, this is like way too bad in, bad in uh, um, a bound. It, it, it's not QI, it shouldn't be QI, right? It, it, should be something, it should be something much less. But when you start take computing, and, and this is still true if you compute J to the Q plus one, but when you start dividing by delta, if you start using better bounds, your bounds with this division starts blowing up. And I worked on this quite a while and I tried to improve this bound and was unable to do it. I still think it's a terrible bound, but this is the bound that you can get. Now, even more interesting is that the coefficients of the modular polynomial itself behave differently. There's a um, well-known result by Paula Cohen who proved that the largest coefficient of the classical modular polynomial, alpha modular polynomial, is basically bounded by six L log L, or grows as six L log L. It's asymptotic to six L log L. But for Drinfeld modules, um, the growth rate is between essentially L and L cubed. And L is actually false. If you do a computations, for example, even just for linear polynomials L, it suggested a growth rate of L squared. So they don't grow like L, they grow like L squared. They simply grow faster than you have in the elliptic curve world. And so there is no way you can ever get this complexity, right? It's just not true. The complexity is just not true. The asymptotic complexity is just not true. And you expect to get a significantly worse result. Now maybe you shouldn't get as bad as L to the eighth and L to the sixth. Um, maybe we should have gotten L to the seven, I'm not sure, but certainly you get something that is significantly worse by multiple orders of magnitude worse. Also, this complexity does not take into account any of the sparseness. So we are treating these as if everything was like completely dense, um, which is actually not true. So I think especially the space complexity is actually a vast overestimate. And then we try to work something with how do you estimate, you know, sparse polynomials and stuff, and it becomes a hugely messy analysis, and we were unable to do this. So this is really not so easy. So this is what we have. Okay, so that's the algorithm. Um, right, so a few uh, words about what we're doing currently. Um, the state-of-the-art algorithm for finding classical modular polynomial is not this one. It's an algorithm due to broker lauder sutherland from 2011, and it uses some very different ingredients, and these ingredients have to be partially developed for the world of Drinfeld modules. The first thing is the Hilbert class polynomial. The Hilbert class polynomial is the polynomial, all of whose roots are the J invariants that have complex multiplication by, the, by, by some fixed order, by the same order O, and it has integer coefficients. And the algorithm to compute, there's an algorithm for computing the Hilbert class polynomial due to Sutherland also from 2011. And it's essentially um, the complexity, time and space complexity is the square root of the discriminant or the absolute value of the discriminant. And that's the size of the coefficients. So you really can't do any better. And so um, this has to be developed for, for Drinfeld modules. And there is some analytic theory there for the J function, but you don't find the term Hilbert class polynomial anywhere in the literature. So we're working on that. So uh, the second ingredient is the so-called isogeny graph. The isogeny graph has as vertices the J invariants and as edges the L isogenies. It's an almost L plus one regular graph, except for some degree one vertices and the ordinary components are volcanoes. And I'll show you in just a moment, you have probably seen pictures of, of volcanoes. They're these beautiful regular looking um, graphs. And um, 
this all holds, sorry, this all holds in the world of train fault modules as well. And in fact, we have an algorithm to generate um, uh, Li Sargini volcanoes. So Sage lets you generate Li Sargini volcanoes for elliptic curves and draws them nicely. Um, we have an algorithm for drain flat modules, but we don't have a drawing program associated with it. Okay, so we have an algorithm, um, but again, it's not state of the art. And then it uses the Chinese remainder theorem. It basically computes this modular polynomial modulo a bunch of suitable primes. And suitable here has a very good meaning about splitting and so on. I don't want to get into that. And then it Chinese remainders. And the time and space complexity for that algorithm is L cubed. So the broker Sutherland algorithm is, has complexity L cubed. The classical analytic method has L to the 4.5. And um, uh, with joint with my PhD student, Edgar Pacheco Castan, we're currently adopting that method to drain fault modules. And we will almost certainly not get L cubed. Um, well, we might, but I don't know, maybe we will. Okay, um, here are some pictures of volcanoes. So here is, so we're looking at the L isogeny graph, the um, vertices are J invariants, the edges are L isogenies. In this case, this is over Q equals three and L is equal to T. And this is one component. This is a highly disconnected graph, but this is one component. And this is a component that contains this J invariant. And you see what they look like. So this is a volcano. In this case, the crater is just what is degenerate. It's one vertex. But then there's all these very nice, regular looking trees hanging off of here. They're all complete. All the leaf vertices are in the same um, uh, level and so on. So you've probably seen pictures like this for elliptic curves. It's the same for transfer modules. Okay, so here's another, oops, um, sorry, I'm, I went. Another example. This volcano actually has an actual crater. It has six vertices, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very short, it's not a very high volcano, right? So it's only height, height one and it has hanging off here these, these stubby little trees. Here um, we have, is this is for a T squared plus T plus two isogeny. So for Q equals three, this has degree nine, degree nine is, nine plus one is 10. So the valency here is 10. So each of these neighbors here has two neighbors in the, each of these vertices has two neighbors in the crater and then eight hanging down. Um, here's another example, that's an aerial view. So here, this is again a T isogeny. So the valency is four. The crater has three vertices here. And then it has, each vertex has these two isomorphic trees hanging down. So we can compute these things. Okay, and for endomorphisms, you only traverse a tiny little piece of this crater, actually only two levels. Um, so we have the machinery to do this and we have the machinery to traverse these, le these levels too. Okay, so some other methods that we're looking at for sort of future work, there's another modular polynomial algorithm due to Enger, but its space requirements are rather prohibitive and they might even be worse for Drenfeld modules. Maybe not because our things are sparse, but I don't know, it's worth looking at because it uses a lot of symbolic computation and symbolic computation works particularly well for drain felt modules. Um, there is an algorithm, the state of the art for computing endomorphism rings of ordinary um, elliptic curves is due to Bisson and Sutherland, again from 2011. Uh, th these boys were busy in 2011. Um, and here, uh, what it does, so you look for the uh, endo, you look for the correct order in the, in the um, isogeny volcano so you look, so all the, all the vertices at the same level have complex multiplication by the same order. And so you're looking for that level and the uh, standard method, cold method traversed, um, basically find, found path sort of in this isogeny volcano and look for it there. This algorithm determines much of that via smoothness testing of relations in class groups. And as a result, it's sub-exponential. It has the same complexity as class group computation. Whereas Cole's algorithm and our algorithm are exponential, this almost certainly works, except it's not always going to be sub exponential because class group computations are only exponential if the genus is large compared to the finite field. So if we are working with orders of, with twin field modules over a small field FQ and the conductors have large degrees, then we might get sub exponential complexity. Otherwise, it's going to be exponential for sure. And then of course, there's the whole world of super singular drain felt modules that we have not yet looked at, um, computing the isogeny graphs, computing the endomorphism rings, et cetera, et cetera. 
So just a reminder what happens in the world of elliptic curves, the isogeny graph over FP squared, all the super singular curves are defined over FP squared. It's actually a Ramanujan graph. It's not a volcano. It's this sort of expander graph. When you restrict to ellip uh, super singular elliptic curves defined over FP, you get a subgraph that's a collection of stubby little volcanoes, volcanoes of height zero or one. And the structure of these things was described very nicely in this, in this multiple author paper in 2019, where they described the structure exactly and, and, and how, they, how these things are situated in the isogeny graph and so on. So very nice. We expect very, very similar behavior for rank two Dwinfeld modules, but we haven't even touched the super singular case yet. And I think that's all I want to say. I'm going to leave you with a nice, sorry, I didn't mean to go to that. Um, I'm going to leave you with a nice picture of, this is because we can't draw our things so nicely. This is an isogeny graph for elliptic curves. This is the two isogeny graph over F1049. This was generated and drawn with Sage by Karanoi. Karanoi, this is not the whole thing. There's a whole bunch of isolated vertices missing. So we only drew the, one, the things that aren't isolated vertices. So here, for example, you get a nice little component and here's a nice little volcano. So we have, here's a beautiful volcano. Most of them are not very interesting, but you get some volcanoes. So I think that's all I want to say. So that's the progress we've made so far on Dwinfeld modules and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>